A very, very warm welcome to everybody in the room and thank you very much for joining us this morning for our spring season of Banking on the Future. Um, we're really delighted that you're here. For many of you, it's your financial year ends, busy times, and uh, we just really appreciate your time. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Deverell-Smith, and I'm going to do my best to facilitate this morning, but I'm very much hopeful that you're going to make my job easy by asking uh, our great panel here lots of questions. So. Um, we have uh, roaming mics, please put your hand up. I'll do my best to spot you and, and, and bring a microphone in your direction. So I'll do my very best to get through as many questions as I can. Lots here, hopefully lots uh, up there in the audience. And, um, and we'll, we'll finish promptly at 9.30. Um, if I could ask for your phones to be on silent, that'd be really, really cool. If there's a fire alarm, uh, leave the building, please. There is no drill, uh, as far as we're aware. So, very quickly, what we're going to do is introduce our panel today, and we'll go from your left, my right, over at the far end, Andy. Morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Keane. I'm Chief Revenue Officer at Fuse. That's Fuse with a three instead of an S, in case you didn't know. Um, and uh, we are a software platform. We help developers and investors, both debt and equity to manage risk, cost, and program across their development portfolios in one single platform. It's one single version of the truth, if you like. Uh, we are sector agnostic, we're geography agnostic. Um, we've got around 1,000 um, projects on the platform today um, in various locations. And we are helping our clients eliminate the inefficiencies of how they track and manage their data and report on that data. Thank you. Mm. Hi, <laughs> morning. Uh, my name is Lucinda Pellinger. I'm the UK Managing Director for the Instant Group. Um, the Instant Group, we are, our proposition is Rethinking Workspace, and we do that by advocating flexibility and agility in workspace. Um, we support occupiers um, of workspace, understanding and navigating through the complexity of the world of um, service and managed offices and we also support landlords, operators and other workspace um, owners uh, in how to get into flex to grow the flex industry. Can anyone hear me? Yes, good morning everybody on this lovely Wednesday morning. Um, my name is Simon Gammon. Um, my history is I started a business called Knight Frank Finance which now forms the uh, financial services part of the Knight Frank group. So my area of expertise is Mainly mortgages, but a little bit of property in there from what I can glean from my colleagues. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sogol Zarin Chang. I'm the managing director of Way of Life. I've been in a living sector, I should call it, for about 20 years. So I've worked for Housing Association, student accommodation, worked for JLL, and now I'm heading up the Way of Life uh, management platform, which is the build to rent platform. So I work with Long Harbour, so they're private equity firms, so we manage their assets, but we recently opened up other services as a third party management to others. And basically we do anything from design, product, uh, consultancy, all the way to end-to-end um, -end management of the asset and placemaking. Brilliant, thank you very much. So um, again, please, audience, you know the drill. Any questions, shoot your hand up. The questions that have come from the audience, I'm gonna amalgamate two. Charlie from the o from OB Private and Tim Sanders from um, Aboda Student, both asked a very similar question, which was around bank banks failing over the past month. Now that has given plenty of us jitters. Simon, maybe I can um, bring you in as, a, as a, a guy whose company talks to banks all day every day, sure. what can you add um, to that? I think my only observation um, from talking to the, the lenders and um, listening to, to what Rob said, I mean, the, the key word for me was confidence. And actually, if you look at what happened at Credit Suisse, they had had a series over a number of years of ch uh, knocks to, their, to everyone's confidence in that institution. And then when it really got quite difficult for them in the last month or two, um, that confidence completely disappeared. They didn't actually have a fundamental capital issue. They were quite well capitalised, but it was the lack of confidence 
and it was fascinating to see how fast that confidence fell away and the amount of people who wanted to take their money out. And that's really what was the nail in the coffin for them. Um, but generally, I would agree, lenders are very positive overall. The big lenders um, are moving their mortgage pricing around a lot at the moment. Um, we've, despite the um, inflation figures we're seeing and where stock rates have been moving around a little bit, we're definitely seeing some reduction uh, in mortgage rates and we expect to see that continue over the course of this year. Not dramatically, I'm afraid this is the new normal where we find ourselves. Mortgage rates have now sort of settled around 4%, uh, 4 to 5%. We might see them come down a little bit more than that, but we're not, I'm afraid, going back to the 1% or 2% that so many of us have got used to. Brilliant, thank you. Um, right, um, we, we've all, um, or we, you guys, all leading businesses, um, uh, have been navigating some choppy waters with um, the trustonomics, inflation, um, very sadly wars overseas, all, all impacting our, our day-to-day -day decisions. So what, what we'd like to do is ask all of you, if that's okay, as business leaders, how have you managed to balance the, 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 the decision between profits and people, um, i.e. retaining your staff with the pressures of hiring uh, of living costs, funding pay rises under the pressures potentially of challenges on your income and uh, top line uh, of, of your P&Ls. Could, could, could you talk us through the decisions you've made and all, all the decisions you plan to make? For me, it was pathway is muddy, unclear, and there will be forever changing direction. So I need to be a bit more optimistic around that based on what Rob and Simon mentioned. So for us, I think because we are in residential market, it's been quite a strong, and I think it's been you know the strongest that I've ever seen because of the demand and supply. There is not a lot coming through the door. There are people who cannot afford to buy or they wish not to buy, uh, and therefore the rental market is quite a strong. So we have seen a significant uh, growth in terms of, of a rental, which actually helping us with some of the challenges around the operation, which, you know, if you look at the operational challenges for us, it's been utility, insurance, um, attracting talents, cost of living, all of that, but we're trying to offset as much as we can with the rental growth and making sure that our procurement exercise is really, you know, looked at and we just try to make savings where we can. So I think for us at the moment, the rental product is the destination for lots of people. If you look at what's happening in the market uh, based on some of the stats that I've seen, it's about 22 application for one property. So that is significant. And that shows that there are lots of people are actually securing their property without even seeing it. And I've seen it, that people are just putting their holding deposit because they're scared they're not gonna have anywhere to live. So that is significant. And the other thing that we're seeing is that normally people will look at the area that they're comfortable with, but now we're seeing two out of five uh, applicants are happy to look anywhere else, which shows that there is a huge pressure in terms of people securing. So for us, rental is good, but I think that we also need to think about the affordability of the people and what's going to happen in the future. because not everyone will be able to afford 15 to up to 20, 25% rental increase. I'm sure. Lucinda? Um, so there's a number of, I mean, in, in our industry, in commercial real estate, um, I think there are, there are probably, the macroeconomic picture is one of three things that have really um, hit our industry. From a, from a personal perspective at the Instant Group, we advocate agility and flexibility in workspace. So when it comes to people, we would say, if, you're, if your top three costs in your business are probably IT people and real estate, traditionally, organizations, when they've had to cut costs, have turned to people, which in many industries is, is probably, if they're your knowledge base and they're your relationship base, probably um, quite a sad state of affairs. And we would advocate that being able to flex your real estate uh, would make more sense than flexing your people. So that's obviously what we've done as a business to navigate. We, you know, we, we flex our real estate up and down um, with the growth and the challenges that we face over the last few years, retaining our people wherever possible. Um, at a broader picture, I think, I mean, the, the interest rates is, is interesting. Um, there's many people in this room that will know a lot more about it than me. My background is uh, HR and people. Um, so it's not finance, but 
If you look at the, the picture in the market at the moment, landlords um, are facing, I think the whole lending situation in commercial real estate is a bit, can I say screwed? Don't know. Um, I just did. Um, because the, the landlords, their valuations, their lending models, the interest rates are going up. They're not getting people to sign 20, 25 year leases, which used to be the absolute standard. Valuations are going down, empty spaces. So I think um, for a lot of landlords, if you've got a great property, um, with strong sustainability in the right location, then I think you're in decent shape. But for a lot of landlords, the interest rates and the valuation models um, that the economic picture have thrown up uh, are causing some huge challenges in commercial real estate. And then I think from an inflation perspective, people have been more reticent to travel into the city. Why would they want to do the commute? Why would they want to spend more money on lunch than they would at home? So I think that's encouraged this kind of hybrid working um, uh, wave that we've seen since the post-pandemic. So there are quite a number of macroeconomic factors that are affecting the industry, which just makes it hugely interesting to work in at the moment. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, so maybe slightly different to the rest of the panel in, in terms of our life stage as a, as a business. We're about three years old, really, since we launched the platform, and we're fairly agile as a result. Uh, we're in growth mode, and we maybe got a separate, different set of challenges, really, just um, particularly on the talent side, hiring. Um, uh, we've yet to see the 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 the, the, sa the wage demands of uh, good candidates come down. Um, it's uh, it's extremely it's, it's rocketed in the last couple of years for people with any sort of experience and what you're looking for, particularly in you know the sales side and things like that. Um, but as a business, we're we've got probably a longer runway than most prop tech firms. Uh, we're fairly well capitalised. We've got a good revenue stream. And we're growing, so we, we 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 have less of those challenges. But we did, our clients, on the other hand, are severely challenged by a lot of volatile market risks, and um, in particular, um, you know, developments that are underway suddenly becoming unviable, um, and contractors going bust. I think we're on a 13-year high in terms of contractors going bust, and it's a real challenge. Um, so companies are really having to become agile where they weren't agile before, adopt technology to help them manage those risks and protect themselves a little bit. And uh, and that's where platforms like Fuse and others come in to really help um, digitize a lot of the processes that are inefficient today. Um, so I think one, one way that we do try and navigate those, those problems is to be, be as efficient as possible with our people, with our processes, uh, digitize as much as we can, and, um, and really trust our people to go and get the job done. Um, so I think it's, for us, we, we see a lot of risks that aren't affecting us, but are affecting our clients, and, and that's what we're, we're there to help them with. Very helpful, thank you. Mr. Mortgages, do you have anything to? Um, I think the original question was what, what are the business is doing and how we're we managing this the last six months. I'm probably at the other end of scale um, in the business I'm in, Andy, Knife Rake's 130 odd years old now. Um, it's very diversified, which is very helpful. So when certain markets, capital markets, debt markets are struggling, um, there are other sectors like rental that will prop the firm up. So overall, uh, the business is in pretty good shape. Um, specifically, my market, as we know, um, when um, the work experience lady, Ms. Mrs. Truss, stood up um, and did her bit in September, um, she created, with her colleague, an interesting time for the mortgage world, which we are, as Rob said, recovering from now. Um, what I found specifically in my business is, was that uh, the activity from people wanting to know what was going on in mortgages went up significantly. We were talking to more people than we'd ever spoken to before, but no one wanted a mortgage post-September. So from a revenue point of view, my challenge has been managing that decline in revenue and what we think is going to be a short-term decline and is, we're already seeing it start to pick up and maintain the team that we have. So we haven't gone down a path of making people redundant anything. We've just accepted that we're going to be less profitable in this six-month window because the important thing is to make sure that we're there for all of our clients and looking after everyone and giving all that advice. And now what's interesting what we're seeing is the people we were speaking to in November and December when they didn't want a mortgage, understandably at 6.5%, they're now saying, actually, I, you know, I, I now need to move forward. I can move forward and I feel I can afford it a bit more. And very quickly, because I, I asked my team yesterday, questions please, guys, and, and I, I, I swear about half of them came back to say, ask Simon, do I fix, do I do a tracker, two years, five years, what's, what's the advice? Oh, that's a lovely question, isn't it? Thank you very much. Um, 
look, everybody's situation is different, so it's it's be wrong for me to give you this is the product for you. But um, what I can tell you is that what we're seeing is uh, a year ago, and in fact for really up a good couple of years up to that point, everybody wanted a fixed rate. Everybody wanted a five-year longer or longer fixed rate. They were down. Five-year fixed rates got down to 0.91 percent at one point, which seems ridiculous now. Um, and that was the product of choice. That's what everybody um, wanted to have. Um, we then went through a period, as we know, over the last few months of great uncertainty, and we've seen a complete shift away from fixed rates. A lot of people that needed to take a mortgage, and a lot of people hadn't, because numbers are down, as Rob said, but a lot of people have chosen tracker rates. Uh, tracker rates generally don't tend to have early repayment charges, so it's essentially someone saying, I'm going to watch the market. I'm hoping that in the short to medium term rates will come down and I will see that impact on my mortgage. If I don't think that's going to happen, I've got the option to fix at some point in the future. So we're seeing a trend of people taking tracker rates. For those that can afford it and for those that are comfortable with a fixed rate at, a higher, at the higher rates we're seeing now, again, we're seeing most people take two-year fixed rates because they want the options uh, uh, to, to, to look at a new rate in the relatively short term. I think the view of everyone that we speak to is that mortgage rates will come down <coughs> in the sort of the two to five year timeline. Whether that uh, will be proven, we'll see. But um, people want the flexibility to do so and to swap products then. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move, I'm going to change themes now a little bit. And as I, I was just going to say, um, a little a little bit biased with this one because it is talent related. But I think all of you, when, when I asked you the last question, referenced talent in one way or another. So the question is, what adjustments can real estate employers make to compete for talent versus the likes of big tech, pharma, law, banking, etc., all of which offer considerably higher salaries to graduates? And if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Lucinda, having had a career in lots of industries before real estate and particularly as an HR professional. Um, I... It's difficult to say really what real estate should look at. I mean, as a you know, 25 years in HR and um, the last 18 months in, in, a, in a commercial role, um, you've, you've got to play to your strengths. So you have to look at the strengths of the industry, strengths of your own business. And I don't think there's one kind of answer that you can give. I think you've just got to look at the whole employee value proposition. What is it you're trying to build about your culture? What is it that you're trying to do with employee engagement? How do you drive productivity? How do you provide um, career development, in-role learning, well-being support. There'll be different things that are important to your people and making sure that you're creating a culture and creating a value proposition that attracts the talent that you want is absolutely critical. And being very purposeful about that and being very um, clear about what that proposition is. I think um, I should talk to you all, not to, not to Andrew. Um, so for me, I don't think there's anything you know, specific about real estate in particular. Um, I do think, I mean, when I talk to people, um, we're interviewing all the time because we're in fast growth mode. It is such an exciting industry to be in. My previous role, without going on about it too much, um, I used to work for the RFU at Twickenham, the governing body of rugby union in England. So everybody wanted to talk about it. It was kind of dinner party chat, you know, who's going to be picked this weekend and what's Eddie Jones or Stuart Lancaster doing. And then when I worked in real estate, it was like, oh, OK. Um, it's like tumbleweed at the dinner party table or in the pub. And now everyone's talking about it, Every, you know, whether it be the resi side of it, whether it be the commercial real estate side, there is so much change going on. Um, the first question people ask, are you in the office? How many days are you in the office? Um, it's an industry that's got to change hugely, um, whether that be on the landlord and the valuations that we've just talked about, whether it be on digitization, ease of purchase. There is so much change in this industry that's going to happen over the course of the next five or 10 years that I think that's probably um, if you get your EVP right, um, and then that for me is the most exciting thing in the industry. You know, that's the reason I would work in real estate at the moment. And for those in the room who don't know what EVP means, employee value proposition. Sorry, <laughs> don't forget it. <laughs> so cool. Um, Andy, I'm going to come to you. Um, Prop tech. There is such. Uh, I mean, it's almost daily new product or um, you know new tool. Um, comes to our landscape. So, um, with 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 the the sort of plethora of solutions in the market, what advice would you give our audience when it comes to making business decisions in terms of investment? Because there's just so much. 
There is, there is a lot, and I'm yet to find one product that does everything a typical client will need. So, but many clients believe that they'll wait and find that product. Um, I think it really comes down to, there, there are a plethora of, of, of options available, and there are some brilliant ideas, brilliant products, um, and unfortunately, a lot of them have very limited runways, and it doesn't fit well with the typical investor Let's say the, on, the, on the investor side, if you're selling to investors, it doesn't really fit well with their sales process, their buy process. It takes a much longer time for them to make a decision on a solution. And sadly, these, a lot of these prop tech ideas end up on the shelf. So um, my advice is to, is to really consider what your business needs and accept that you might have to take on multiple platforms to deliver on what you're trying to achieve. Um, it, there isn't a product out there that will do everything for you. Um, many bigger funds and, and investors have tried to build their own and ultimately failed. Uh, it cost them a lot of money, a lot more money than they would have spent adopting various other platforms. Um, so you've got to look at what's going to provide you efficiency. Uh, technology in its essence is going to speed up processes and make you more efficient and more sure about what you're doing. Um, so you've got to find solutions that fit with what you're trying to achieve as a business. And Certainly what we see, um, if, I, if I could be general about how we, how we add value to, to customers, it's really on the efficiency piece. And, but the challenge is demonstrating that efficiency gain and have, you know, it's a very consultative process. So the best, kind of, certainly from a sales perspective, the best kind of salespeople are those that are really curious, inquisitive about the customer, understanding their current processes and seeing if and whether that customer should invest in us or, or a different platform. Uh, we're very open to qualifying out of opportunities that aren't a good fit and we'll be open with clients if that's the case but I think generally speaking there's 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 a, too much inertia and a lot of um, well we've done it this way for so long and it's been okay we'll just persevere and carry on um, but it would shock you to, to see how antiquated some processes still are um, in the in the real estate industry as a whole um, that you know drastically need to kind of upgrade and digitize and improve. Um, everyone says it, you know, numerous conferences, someone will say, oh, real estate you know, lags behind other sectors and it's adoption of technology. Um, it's absolutely true, um, but there are signs that that is changing. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, investors, developers, uh, agents on the consultancy side adopting new ways of working and, and some of that tech, I look at PropTech in a couple of different ways. There's, there's tech that is designed to enhance the experience within a building, the tenant experience and so on. And then there's tech that helps companies operate more efficiently. We're, we're in the latter. But there's a huge amount of amazing tools out there that, that you, you have at your disposal. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's pretty um, minimal investment, really, uh, in the grand scheme of things. When you, if you use it well and adopt it well, onboard it well, you'll see the benefits you know, tenfold and, and more. Thank you. Now, I'm conscious of time already. We're, we're approaching quarter past, which means we've got 15 minutes. And if anyone wants to ask a question, please put your hand up. I'm going to ask another one now, and I'm going to start so good with you, but I, I, I think it applies to everybody on the panel. So, should companies prioritise the needs and preferences of their tenants and customers or their obligations to their shareholders and investors? And how can they balance these potentially conflicting interests? So cool. Very good question. <laughs> so I think um, we obviously need to look after the investors. So they are our clients and they have a set of expectation. And when you are sitting in this um, operational camp, you always need to balance both. So you have the, the customers and customers needs and you also have the investors interest uh, at heart too. So I think for us is more about um, having value for money rather than having a, a cheap product. And I think that's what I will always say in terms of your, you know, what customers are looking for is somewhere safe, secure, they will be looked after. And they also have this uh, security of the tenure. So they know that they can stay with you beyond the 12 months or they can stay for three years or five years. So I think that's what we need to focus on in terms of, and also they're looking for some kind of a community engagement. They want to feel that they are part of that community. And I know lots of us are building and we just have a tick box in front of us to say, yes, Jim, put it in, amenity space, put it in. You know, and I think we just need to walk away from that. And everyone's got these assumptions that 
everyone will be 25 to 35 years old. And what I'm seeing is that that is definitely shifting. So I'm seeing retiree, divorcee, families living in other buildings, and they have a different needs. So our job as an operator is that to make sure that we're answering that, you know, responding to that needs rather than one size fits all. And if you look at the investor side of uh, thing, you just need to let them know what the customers are looking for so they will make good decision rather than ill decision, which is going to help them in terms of running that building and the operational cost as well. So it's a it's balancing act, but if we don't look after the investors, it means that we don't have a lot of them coming to the market, which means we're going to help the customers even further because that supply and demand will not uh, be balanced as well. Thank you. Tom? Um, I guess I just have a slightly different challenge. Knight Frank is privately owned, so we don't have shareholders. Um, there's about 75 equity partners in Knight Frank around the globe. And um, what I can say is we all talk an enormous amount. And we are talking every week. We are meeting regularly. Uh, and our number one primary focus across all of those areas of the business is the client. So the client is always coming first. Um, and because we answer to each other, um, uh, we talk an awful lot. Um, but it's the, the, the consensus has always been, and the feeling and the culture of Night Frank has always been around the client's needs come first, and then we all work together to support each other uh, to facilitate whatever services they want. Lucinda, you, you must be answering these types of debates a lot uh, in the office market. Um, I mean, I think this is a slightly purist uh, view, but for, from the businesses that that I've worked in, I mean, last time I was in non-for-profit, so it was slightly different, but where I am today, um, it might sound cheesy, but we're aligned with our investors. If we focus on the client, then we know that the results will come. So there are there are conflicts sometimes, and of course you have to work through them, but um, I, in the current business I'm in, we haven't had a, a ma massive problem with it. I think if you focus on the client and you understand the client um, to the point that was made earlier, um, and you really understand your client and their needs and wants, then your business is gonna grow and do well, which will satisfy your investors. So. Yeah, and for me, um, prior to joining Fuse, um, I was part of the leadership team at uh, CoStar Group, which is a NASDAQ listed um, business and, you know, valued at 35 billion or so. So a very different set of challenges uh, to where I am now, where we have a one, we're mostly private, privately funded uh, by our CEO. Uh, we have some investment from one, one private equity house. Um, so we have to obviously satisfy that investment, but naturally we are, we are a prop tech firm, and if you look back at how venture capital would, uh, firms would value prop tech firms, you know, even as recently as a year or two ago, it was all about driving ARR to the top line, um, and you would get a 10, if you, someone wanted to buy your investment, you'd get 10x plus on, on that be your valuation. It's, it's completely changed now, so you have to be, you have to show a, 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 either that you are profitable or you've got a clear path to profitability. So that's what that's what we are all about. We want to grow the top line, of course. We have to grow the business, but um, not at the expense of becoming profitable in the near future. So um, so that that's the way we look at things. Very different for a, a listed company, obviously, and, and like CoStar. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask another pre-suggested um, pre, uh, question here from Paul Cook of Garton Jones, I uh, think it's a great question. He's asked, will central London outperform the country regions in terms of activity across the next 12 months? If I just add one thing uh, before Simon, I think that um, I'm just looking at from a, a rental market. Mm. And I think that London's got a lot more to offer in terms of diverse type of properties, the price point and, you know, the opportunities as well. And if you look at the stat, it says, 6.4% uh, growth in Londoners age 40 to 49 every year. And if they cannot purchase, and if the mortgages are going down from 60,000 to 40,000, I think London is still gonna be in a huge demand as well. Thank you. I was just gonna add um, just a couple of things in London's favor. Uh, it, it does have the currency situation at the moment. There's a lot of foreign investors that still see London as a very attractive place to own property. And as particularly if you're dollar based or um, some other currencies, that's in London's favour. They're more likely to buy in London. 
And obviously, over the last few years, we've not really seen London grow in house prices particularly. Um, they're still below where they were in 2015, generally. So, whereas if you look at the country, particularly in uh, certain sectors, such the southwest, for example, the flight to the country we saw through COVID, house prices grew enormously there. So, um, I'm quite pro London, but I accept your your, your concerns. It's in there. And just to give a different lens, uh, in the, on the on the side of the regions. Um, being a Londoner, though, uh, we are seeing, so you look at commercial real estate, the demand is higher in the regions it is in, than it is in London. People who want to work near home or who are at home um, versus coming into London every day. So I think London has got a challenge. If you're in a retail business and you're a pretty low margin business and you had footfall five out of seven days a week and now that's gone to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays and you've got a footfall three out of seven days a week, you're starting to see big challenges there. The demand for workspace, flexible workspace, service office space in the regions is higher. Um, and I think there is um, a sustainability element of that too. Why would you, you know, if you could walk or you could cycle locally, and if you look at going back to talent and what talent care about and your proposition to talent joining your business, they care about the planet and they care about sustainability. And getting on an hour and a half train journey every day makes less sense or getting in the car makes less sense than going to a, a space um, near a home. So I think, um, I, I do think there's a, there'll be a strong resurgence in London and we are seeing demand in certain areas of London go up, but certainly the regions are outperforming at the moment. Yeah, I think it ties into the, the flexible working return to office piece. I think there's no doubt really now that, um, you know, no one's going to be working five days a week in their office and unless through choice and that's a fairly small contingent of uh, the population and I think the it ties in with everything else so like you've got the the tenant demands on rented sector and, and living and in offices are geared around where can I get the best quality space well amenitized space and obviously it's got to be energy efficient I mean that that last part is really table stakes now if it's not um, cutting the mustard in terms of being energy efficient, then um, they're not interested. So I think the it all ties into empl employers trusting their employees, focusing in on well-being and uh, lifestyle, uh, in addition to obviously being productive and helping uh, the business grow. But I think it's all kind of intertwined and there, there was a massive shift um, and people don't want to reverse it. So I think that's what we're going to be challenged with. And I think that does lend itself towards regional growth more than, more than London. Interesting, very interesting, thank you. Uh, right, another quick question, uh, skipping around here. It was a cracker, so I want to ask it because I have no idea what the answer may be. Um, with everyone talking about chat, GPT and AI, what are your views on how and when this will meaningfully impact on our industry? Andy, I'll go with you again, because this is... Um, in some ways, it's already meaningfully impacting our industry, I have to say. Um, I think AI is a broad term and scary in some ways, but um, some AI is incredibly powerful. Um, I was speaking to someone yesterday who runs a, a different prop tech firm and they've built their product to be global from the get-go. And global by means of being in every language, so if you can think of the real estate market, wherever there's buildings, <laughs> uh, you know, you can read and use the platform in your local language. And they use Google Translate um, as their AI tool, which is, you know, dramatically more accurate than it was even a couple of years ago. Um, so tools like that are phenomenal. I think other tools aren't quite there yet. Um, you've got lots of things like lease reading software and various other things for the, the real estate sector that only get you so far. Um, for me, I've yet to find really a lot any AI tools that don't still require some human intervention. Um, and I think that's critical to have that there as a check, as a like quality assurance that, that you're not just solely relying on uh, on machines. Uh, but the chat GPT thing is really, it's quite remarkable. And I think what, where you see it misused. Um, I saw someone post that a, a, a candidate had put basically copied and pasted too much from chat GPT in their covering letter for their job um, and uh, hadn't edited anything. Um, so, uh, you know, it can be misused, but I think for marketing, for messaging, for making you get your content prepared much quicker, um, I think it could be great. And, you know, it's very, very smart having, having used that a couple of times from yeah. a Valentine's card I, and things. I actually used it last week to learn more about other competitors. So I asked chat GPT, can you tell me what other competitors are doing? which was fascinating. 
Yeah, it's quite scary. Lucinda, you're on a huge digitalization journey, I believe. AI and how you leverage it? Well, not my specialist subject. <laughs> Um, but we are on a huge digitalization journey and it speaks to the challenge I was talking about earlier about the ease of procurement of real estate. It is difficult. Um, if you speak to people outside of the industry and they wanted to get, I don't know, 30 desks on Regent Street, um, they'd probably Google 30 desks on Regent Street. They might have heard of WeWork, they might have heard of Regis, they may have heard of one or two landlords, but there really is no destination that you trust that you can go to to see the whole market. And a lot of organisations are trying to do a sort of book and pay, and that would either be you as an individual self-employed or through, through your corporation, through the, the organisation that you work for, um, and a white-labelled platform. But what we're trying to do is not only have a book and pay capability where you can say, right, I'm on Regent Street, I've got a meeting in the city later on, I need two hours, set down space, book and pay, around the corner, off I go. But that should start to get to know you like other platforms that you use would and what you like and the amenities that you like and other people that you know in the local area that you may or may not want to see um, and it starts to get to know you and it starts to pull to the top of the list the things that you will like so it's not quite answering the question but that's the sort of journey we're going on we're trying to make it much smarter so that when you buy workspace as an individual as a corporate whether it's a meeting room for one hour or a huge portfolio that you're making smarter decisions about what you're buying based on the criteria and the data that are important to you um, and how the technology can help us get better and better at that is something that we're focusing a lot on. Thank you. Um, guys, I think we're running out of time, two minutes left, but there's one more question that I really want to ask. I was prepping again this morning and I thought, I, w I, w I want to know the answer to this one. Um, so forgive me, it's, it's a, it's a money-related question from Cash, uh, who is Director of Cash Ventures. And the question is this, probably um, for you, Simon, firstly, but uh, do you see cryptocurrency taking over the future as the primary method to be widely used globally, brackets, in residential property transactions? Well, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to speak on the residential sector for a second. I think, you know, there's a very small percentage of people I would suggest in this room that really understand cryptocurrency. And when it comes to your main home, the biggest financial asset most people ever have, and their mortgage, their biggest financial commitment they'll ever have, they're unlikely to go into it uh, using a currency or, a, or a, a product that they just don't understand. So um, I'm not saying that cryptocurrency doesn't have its place. Um, I put my hands up and say that I struggle to understand it all, um, and I certainly wouldn't be taking a mortgage in one. Um, so that would be my view. Thank you. Big, big topic. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm under pressure to ask the one question here. There's, there's a lady on the front row, but as you're on the front row, you can rugby tackle, particularly Lucinda, who's a rugby uh, uh, fan. Um, Laura, do we, have, do we have a microphone? We have to be really quick, but yeah. thank you. I'm Ika Techa of Amro Partners. I'm also chair of the UK PropTech Association. So um, my, my question is about the labor force. I mean, this is, um, this, it's been a very interesting uh, panel discussion. If, if I could get some soundings on productivity rather than um, head, headline wage inflation, that would be great. And I also want to ask about what the panel thinks about how productivity is changing with the remote uh, working culture. Has it, imp has it improved? Has it you know, j just been level? Or has it actually turned into a four-day week? We need to be super quick, guys. Great questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, from a prop tech point of view, um, where we mostly hire software developers and salespeople, um, productivity is typically quite easy to measure with various metrics that we that we would naturally use. So you can kind of measure things that way. Um, when you're a fledgling comp company, you need to build a culture. So we're quite insistent that you come into the office three to four days a week so that we can start building that culture together and actually have an identity. So um, so we are around each other much more than others. Um, I know others that come in once a month, uh, which I think would be very challenging. Anybody else? Um, I think from my side, um, we were very much a five days a week in the office business pre-COVID. Now we are not. Now we're very flexible. I think this probably won't surprise you, but what we're seeing is um, uh, some people who absolutely want to be in the office five days a week need that social engagement, don't want to be at home. The majority of the room loving it and wanting to have that flexibility and they're definitely no less pro productive, uh, productive. And there's probably 10% of the, the, the team that need 
more self need more encouragement to work uh, <laughs> and they're the ones we say come into the office I don't think um, productivity has gone down I don't accept that at all I think if you're managing to outputs then you know whether people are productive or not. If you create an environment that enables them to be productive and they know when they're working at home or when they come into the office, the office is the kind of place that can help them be productive. How you design an office can really help people's productivity during that time. And I don't think that um, the, the, the move to working from home um, slashes productivity. I think there's so much more going on there around your culture, your engagement, how you manage people. Um, how you manage people is exactly the same as how you manage them in the office, but you have to be better at it when they're at home. So you need to upskill your managers to drive that productivity. But so I don't accept that productivity has gone down. So. If I just go quickly, I don't think it will impact the productivity. But the only concern I've got is about the new talents that you bring to your organisation. They have no chance to talk to anyone. So I think you know it's so much you can do through Team and Zoom, but it's nothing like face to face. And also our business is more about human to human and we need to serve people on site. I agree with that. The only thing I, I challenge myself on, because I agree with you and I advocated that for a long time and the osmosis of learning in the office, but I think that we have to, that's how it worked for us. And there's a generation of kids that have come through university who've actually studied remotely. It's how they work. So I think whilst I don't disagree with you, I think we just have to challenge ourselves. You know, I'm kind of like not very far off 50. Do I really understand what 20 year olds want and how they're going to work and how they're going to be productive? So I think we just have to make sure that we're not saying it worked for us. So that's how it will be. And we just challenge ourselves. Fair point. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, that's a wrap. Thank you ever so much, everybody. I'm sorry we were over around by a couple of minutes. Most thanks to you for coming. <laughs>